your higher planks are going to be a softer timber again, are they? Because they're easier to work with, or...? White cedar. Right. Yeah, that's what the plans call for. Okay, yep. Um, we had a visit from Stu from Danger Marine. He came by to check on our progress with Arabella and shoot some video for his own YouTube channel. And then uh, the keel timber here is one piece of white oak that is 25 feet long, yep. 10 inches thick and 16 inches wide. Wow. And it's clear of the heart and it's clear of the sap. Wow. So that came out of half the diameter of the tree, okay. less than half. But all the other timber for the boat, um, we either cut it here on the property or we cut it off local properties from people who donated yeah. the timber. Um, so, so far, the keel timber is the only piece of wood that we yeah. bought. So what I've realized is that I think a steel boat's much easier. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice to uh, have you guys showing me around, so thank you very much. It's uh, nice welcome. to see the boat. It's such, a, it's such a beautiful sight to actually see it, you know, in the flesh. It's, yeah. You know, it's, it's nice on camera, but then suddenly you see it and you're like, wow, that's a pretty boat. Gives so, a little different perspective. Yeah, yes. So congratulations to both Thanks. of you. Yeah, thank you very I much. I can't wait to meet you on well. the water somewhere. Yeah, you're Absolutely. definitely going to beat us onto the water. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've been cheating. <laughs> Restoring a boat's much easier than uh, building one from scratch. Yeah. I think uh, I'm impressed. So Thanks. thank you, guys. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Good to have you. With the hot months of summer behind us, it was time to take down the old sails we had used to help keep the boathouse a little bit cooler. And we still had a few more things to figure out before we can get back to planking. So the last little bit we've been working on the prop shaft assembly and that for us has been a little bit challenging because we're pretty much at the mercy of Joe the machinist. At this point Alex and I's skills with the bridge port and the metal lathe are not up to snuff to do the machining that we need to do. Uh, so while we've been kind of waiting on Joe a little bit when he has the time to come over and help us with that, we've been ticking off a bunch of other little projects so that as soon as we get the prop shaft assembly wrapped up, we can just motor right into planking and be nonstop. So one of the big tasks we did was get our winter firewood done. It was not very exciting, but it's really great to have that off our plate and not to have to think about it. And the more exciting thing we got accomplished was getting all of these roller assemblies put in. So when we picked up the bridge port and the metal lathe from Kathy and Paul, we saw all of these rollers in boxes in their barn. And uh, we asked them, like, what are you guys doing with those? And it turns out they didn't really have a plan for them and they decided they wanted to donate them. So they dropped them off and we took a few days and Alex learned how to MIG weld and he welded up all of these um, track assemblies for them. And we put in all of these rollers and rearranged the machinery here a little bit. So now we can bring a 20 foot plank into the boathouse, run it through the planer, roll it off to the side, roll it back and send it back through and never have to pick it up, which is gonna make planing all the planking stock and the decking and everything else that we have to do tremendously easier. So thank you so much to Kathy and Paul for that. Um, and now we're just almost done with the prop shaft assembly. So we're gonna do uh, a little bit of rivet testing and get that system set up so that as soon as we start hanging cedar here, we're good to go. All right, I believe we have everything we need here to do some testing of our rivets and the rivet gun and make sure that we have all of that dialed in before we go and start hanging some cedar planks. So we got a chunk of frame facsimile here. We've got some hunks of cedar milled up to the planking thickness. We've got our rivets, the drill, the backing iron, the rivet gun that we got donated. So now we're gonna set all of this up and take everything for a test drive and make sure that we have all the kinks worked out and that the system's gonna work and that things are good before we jump on the boat and try to start hanging some cedar planks. Cool. It's gonna be loud. <laughs> <laughs>
What's up? This one, I just like hit it too kept hard. Kept it and it just kept, just kept going. going deeper and deeper into the cedar. It's also one of the ones with the smaller head. This, so that might be something to, to be yeah. aware of. Yeah, it came out a little bit. We'll definitely have to back them. Good? I think so. Okay. <laughs> Could you even feel it? I mean, I can feel it coming back a little bit, but you can barely feel it. We're taking our homemade rivets for a test drive before we commit to installing them in the planks. And the process for it is we start with a quarter inch bit with a counter bore and we drill through the cedar and through the oak and then we hammer in one of our homemade rivets and we were hammering them by hand and it's a quarter inch hole and the shank here is a quarter inch wide so the corners of it were biting in and we found that hammering it in actually took a significant amount of force and time so it's quicker to use the rivet gun uh, with a flat head in it and drive them in so once they're driven in the next step is to put a rove on them. And the rove is this conical washer here. And as you can see, it doesn't quite fit over. And that's by design, so that when you put the rove on, it kind of bites into the copper um, rivet and everything stays put. So one of our followers, Caitlin Call, out in Colorado, I believe a while back, made us um, a small backing iron for our travels. And right now for our use, she made us a rove set. So this has got a hole in it that the rivet can fit into and it's dished to match the rove. So you just nestle the rove in there, put it on the rivet, smack it a couple times with a hammer, and it sets the rove down onto the rivet. And then the bolt cutters nip it off, and we're still working on exactly how much to leave sticking out so we can form the head. And then we use the aforementioned Ingersoll Rand rivet gun, and we switch out the tip so we've got one that's domed and we found that that works pretty well for getting the mushroom to start on the head and then we have it's actually in the gun a domed one and we've been using that one to finish it off much better and so far that seems to be working really well we might have to pick up another one or two of these guns they're not cheap but it might be better than switching out these bits. But so far, this all seems to work really well, and I'm sure by the time we hang our first plank and put in the first 40 to 60 rivets that we'll have this system uh, even more dialed than we have it now. But so far, this seems good, and I think we can jump in the boat and start hanging planks with this. While we're talking about the processes for getting back into planking, there is one more thing that we need to talk about, and that is dealing with knots. Um, so anytime that you get stock, you're going to find knots. Um, it's very difficult to find stock that doesn't have knots in it. And although our planking stock is really, really nice, we do have some knots. Um, and there are basically two different kinds of knots that we need to talk about. And that is dead knots and live knots. So basically the difference between the two is the included bark. So basically the way that they are created is that the dead knots are created when there's a tree that's growing and a branch on the outside dies, the tree will continue growing and incorporates that entire branch, um, the bark and all. And so the bark ends up being included into the material of the tree. Whereas live knots will continue to grow, will be branches that continue to grow with the tree. So the, br the bark on the outside will continue to move out and not be included inside the material. Why is that a big deal? Because when the bark is on the inside of the material, it basically creates like a sleeve that will allow the rest of that knot to fall out, or it can just create places for water to seep in. Um, and obviously, if the knot comes out, this is a big problem for you. You have a big hole in your boat. So we want to take care of those. So what do we do? Um, knots with included bark like this, the dead knots, are usually able to be pounded out. And we've pounded this one out before, so I'm going to do that now and show you what that looks like. So this is what it does. It'll basically come right out in a little dowel. This is basically the little branch that died on the inside of the tree. And you can see on the inside it's all dark and um, has all that included bark. 
So now that you have a hole, what do you want to do? Um, we've done our research and basically you want to put a plug into those and the best way to do that that we found is to put in a tapered plug. So we're going to take this tapered reamer and you ream out the hole until you can fit in one of these dowels. It's a tapered dowel um, and to make those we basically got these souped up um, pencil sharpeners. Uh, you would make a dowel and then as you twist these in there it cuts a taper on the end. Um, and it's a little slow and doesn't work very well by hand, so we actually manufactured a little bit for our drill. So all we got to do is make a uh, piece of stock like this that has a square end, fits right in here. And then on the lathe in the garage, we, uh, not the metal lathe, we have a wood lathe. <laughs> we would basically make a round dowel, and then that fits right in here. And as you turn it, it basically makes the plug. Now that we have our dowel and we have the tapered cutter, um, let's ream out this hole and we'll show you exactly how to do that. Um, basically, we wanna try to conserve as much of the outside of the wood uh, as possible because as the tree grows around here, these uh, fibers tend to create a swirl and basically we wanna try to use that to our advantage. Um, so, as we cut with the tapered reamer, we want to make sure that the bigger side is on the outside of the planking. Now that may seem to be counterintuitive, but if we think about this, if we make a tapered hole here and put a tapered plug in it, um, if it does ever want to fall out, it's probably going to fall out towards the big side. Um, but if the ocean water is pushing up against this, it'll be more, it'll actually create pressure to keep that plug against the planking and not let it fall out. So that's the idea for that. Now let's ream this out and I'll show you guys um, what's next. Almost there. There's a little bit of bark still in there. pretty decent. So now that we have our tapered hole, you would think to just put that right in there. Um, but as you do that, you want to make sure that you're not gluing these in. Now people are probably going to tell us to use epoxy, use glue, whatever. Um, that is actually not what you want to do. What that acts as is it'll keep it in one place and won't let it move. And then that'll probably act like a wedge and can split the plank. So instead what we're going to do is make thickened shellac, um, which is going to act kind of like a, a glue, but is not as strong. So we'll dip that into the shellac, put that right in there, twist it tight, and that'll hold it well enough. And then you can see both sides are sticking out. We'll cut those flush, and then that'll act as the tapered plug that we need. And what the shellac will do is keep it in place just long enough so that while that plank swells, um, it won't start pushing the plug out. And once it actually gets a good purchase on it, it'll just swell around the plug. The plug will swell into the wood and then it won't be able to come out. So that is the process for um, plugging in the knots. Joe is back to finish up building the steady rest that will hold pieces while we mill on the lathe, including the plastic we are boring out to make our stern post liner. But let's take a quick review of the prop shaft assembly for Arabella. Last week, we worked on making the inside pieces that will hold the stuffing box. The stuffing box clamped to this piece will prevent any water from getting through to the inside of the boat. As the prop shaft passes through the stern post, the plastic liner will connect the stuffing box on the inside of the boat to the cutlass bearing on the outside. And this is the casting that was Victoria's cutlass bearing. As you can see, this thing is a monstrosity. Um, and inside of that goes this sleeve. Uh, and the sleeve has a rubber liner in it and it has grooves so the water can get down there and act as lubrication and cooling. And the sleeve will end up getting forced down into the cutlass bearing and eventually this piece will wear out. We'll take the cutlass bearing off and replace it. But this, believe it or not, is what acts as the bearing for the prop shaft. And we're going to reuse this casting. And the reason for that is this is what a modern cutlass bearing looks like. And as you can see, 
it just has two very small attachment points. This one's for a little bit smaller boat, but the bigger ones are basically just a bigger version of this. And you can see they're 90 degrees to the shaft. So we'd have to cut a pretty big cutout for this to fit in. Where with Victoria's casting, it's already at almost the right angle because the boats are so sim similar. And we still have those two fastenings, but we also have the wings on the side. So this is just going to be a lot more robust and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so we're going to reuse that. Victoria didn't have any sort of liner in her stern post. So if any sort of Torito worms or anything got past the prop shaft, they would have unfettered access to the stern post. And we really don't want that. So we want to put in a liner. And what we've elected to go with is Delrin. Um, so this is a really hard, tough plastic that they use for uh, actually bearings. Um, so the prop shaft won't actually touch the Delrin. There will be clearance all around it for the water to go in and act as the lubrication and the cooling. But if for any reason we do get some sort of wobble in the prop shaft, say we take a knock somewhere down the road and it bumps up against this Delrin, the Delrin will survive that really well and it shouldn't hurt the bronze and it should keep any sort of creepy crawlies from getting inside the stern post. So as you can see, this is just a solid rod. So we have to put that in the lathe and turn it into a tube so that we can use that. Something like that. 16, 18 inches, something like that should be plenty. Okay. We can get a drill that will do 16 inches and still have a shank on it and everything. It looks like we can do it. We got 20 inches. 21 if we want to get real squirrely. We can't, we're already <laughs> off the end. Yeah. <laughs> now, the fun part comes. When you go in with a drill like this, you've only got 6 inches of travel. Yeah. So you can drill in six inches, and in the meantime, you got to be pulling out to clear everything. And one of the issues with Delrin is it gets hot. So we we'll have to find some way of cooling it. And we've beaten on that drill bit. We might want to uh, do some honing on that edge before we do it. Oh yeah, we clean it up. It's got to be sharpened. It's got to be dead perfect sharpened. I'll leave that to you. for today. Sounds good. We were really hoping to get the prop shaft stuff done before we got on to hanging the cedar planks, but unfortunately it's been taking us a bit longer to get that done than we uh, originally thought it was. We're a little bit at the mercy of Joe the machinist and although he's retired he still has a life. Um, so while we're waiting on that, we're going to jump in and get two more cedar planks on the boat. We can do that before we really have to do anything with the prop shaft. We were hoping to leave ourselves that little bit of extra wiggle room, but I don't know, we gotta get moving here. So we're gonna put those cedar planks on and then we can drill the prop shaft a little bit later. Hopefully that'll buy us enough time that we can wrap that stuff up. So before we can hang the cedar, the next thing we need to do is put in a good lining off batten so that we can figure out exactly how we wanna fill the space between the shear and the last oak broad strake that we just put on. Okay, can you swing towards the garage? Before we sprung the batten onto the boat, we needed to line off again. Back when we put on the garboard, we lined off from the rabbit, but going forward we were going to need to line off from the shear. We'll get deeper into why we're doing this now in the next video. We were still in the middle of it when Joe showed up, and we quickly shifted gears to focus on boring the Delrin liner. Steve waits for no one. A freaking boat to build, man. Can't be wallet, gagging.
We ran a test piece through to make sure everything was going to work when we moved up to the full size version. Just to see if we can comfortably machine plastic with what I have at the moment. Joe used a lathe in the bridge port to fabricate a boring bar as none of our drill bits were big enough to get to the final size we needed. That wall looks thick enough to survive for quite a while. Yep. So, yeah, I would say continue, sir. Yeah, 